Hello class, we're covering the Constitution today, right? We covered the historical background to it, right? With the uh, most popular interpretation as to uh, popular feelings of the inadequacies of the uh, Confederation and how that led to enough consensus uh, coupled by other circumstances like the writings of the Federalist Papers and Shays' Rebellion uh, to get enough conservative sentiment to uh, get nine states to ratify the less democratic, more centralized constitution for our federal republic uh, than we had under the more democratic, decentralized confederation. So now we're looking at the uh, document itself, and I ask you to put things into three categories, right? Uh, either enlightened, conservative, or pragmatic. So enlightened, right? Kind of like progressive. It mean it has like a very specific definition, and then it has more of a, a broad definition, and I kind of I mean both. Um, so with the Enlightenment, right? Uh, you're looking at uh, remember in the War for Independence handout, I described the Enlightenment on number two in Bernard Balin's book on the ideological origins of the Revolution. So you look at things like natural rights, um, the social contract, checks and balances, right? Um, anything that's just, and then in a broader sense, anything that seems to um, <clears throat> be to the left from the time of the French Revolution, something, something different, something more egalitarian, putting everybody on equal footing uh, than had been in the past. Okay, so we'll get into examples of that. And then conservative, just to conserve that which history, tradition, the status quo, the way things are now, right? Uh, conservative, just um, anything that, uh, that was not very novel in 1787, like giving a lot of power to a king or a queen, uh, to have unelected people with given uh, much power, uh, to have privileges for some at the expense of others, uh, to... Um, have a, a, a strongly centralized government, like a unitary government where the, the central government dictates to the local regions. Those have all been done in the past, right? To okay slavery. Slavery had been established uh, for quite some time. That's conserving old traditions, right? <clears throat> and then pragmatic. Uh, to me, pragmatic is that you're, you're amoral. You don't worry about doing what you ethically believe is right or wrong. You're not an ideologue where that you're fixated on, on a certain plan for the world to make it better and you stick to that plan, but you're, you just do whatever you think yields the most immediate, practical, beneficial results, okay? Uh, pragmatic. So any kind of compromise would be considered pragmatic, okay? You're not necessarily putting about what you believe in or what you're even for, per se, but you know that, hey, if I compromise with this other faction, I at least get a little and something small is better than nothing at all. <clears throat> it makes them happy so that they'll cooperate with me on such and such issues or even cooperate in ratifying this constitution. That could be an example of pragmatic. So here we look at number one, the preamble. Uh, we the people uh, do ordain and establish this constitution. So you have a uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U, -S -S -E uh, Rousseau's social contract book has this notion, as well as John Locke's second treatise on government uh, with the Enlightenment, and uh, the idea of uh, popular sovereignty that uh, we've already gone over this with number two of the War for Independence with Bernard Balin's book, uh, that governments derive their, their authority, their justification, uh, th the reason for which we can give our consent and assent to the governing powers, our permission, if you will. Uh, it's just that, is based upon our consent, okay? And so that's an enlightened part to the preamble, the beginning part of the Constitution. Okay, conservative, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Um, the conservatives, the Tories in England come, that we came from politically with our traditions, right? Uh, those were typical reasons for which conservatives for centuries 
have felt that um, re reasons for which government exists is to keep law and order, is to make sure that there's unity, to make sure that there is safety for the inhabitants, uh, almost like government being like a straitjacket to, to, to keep the crazy people, to keep those who would inevitably abuse their freedom uh, under control. To me, all those are conservative aims. Those are old school reasons uh, for, um, for government. And so notice, right, in the preamble, when they say why they want this government, uh, pretty much all, uh, this is subjectively me, but pretty much all the major reasons for which they claim they're establishing this new constitution are conservative. To make sure we have a more perfect union between the states, to establish justice and peace and tranquility, uh, provide for the common defense, general welfare, those are conservative arguments. Uh, the one that I left out, however, is the very last one, and to secure the blessings of liberty. And I could have and should have added that to the enlightened list. So notice what I want you to do in this assignment. I want you to have one list that says enlightened, a second list that says conservative, a third list that says pragmatic. And I want you to give at least three to four examples under each of those categories. And I want you to briefly, just in a sentence or so, um, defend why you put it in that category, okay? And what I'd like you to do is when all is said and done, I'd like you to have something in at least the first three articles uh, on at least one of the lists, okay? First article is Congress. The second article is the executive or president. And the third article is this, the Supreme Court and the judicial system, all right? So moving on to the next one if I may here. Um, Article 1, Congress, right? Well, what do you find enlightened about it? Well, I just want to give some examples here to kind of get, get the ball rolling in your head, okay, as far as your assignment. Sections 1 through 3, laws require a majority <clears throat> uh, by both branches, uh, one elected, and initially, right, the, um, the senators were elected by elected state reps, and so uh, that, that goes in line with Montesquieu's Checks and Balances and his book, The Spirit of the Laws. So you have one democratically elected house, another that is one step removed from being popularly elected, and laws have to pass the majority in both of those. They have to cooperate. They have to agree with one another uh, in passing a law, right? So arguably, that's kind of a check and balance. That's a sense of, of equilibrium, if you will. All right. Section two, uh, house reps are directly elected by the citizens for only two years. Then they must run for reelection. They must be an inhabitant of the state in which they're representing. So that's the idea that they must know what life is like in their area and also uh, are held accountable, theoretically, at least, if not literally, uh, living in the place that they represent so that there's actual representation and not virtual that we talked about in the War for Independence. And also they had the power of impeachment, of removing, right, uh, in particular the president. So those are powers, right, checks and balances and powers uh, that I would argue that are enlightened. Uh, anything that holds uh, uh, leaders accountable. So, of course, election, uh, a check from another branch that holds them theoretically accountable in one manner or another. Uh, to me, that would be considered enlightened, right? That's in, in, in view with the enlightenment. That wasn't really the norm going back in early modern and especially medieval history, okay? Then um, section three, senators must be inhabitants of their states. Same thing. There must be direct representation. They have the power to try impeachments uh, if a president is impeached. And so that's a check and, and balance, right? Uh, they have to uh, directly represent those that they're speaking before, uh, speaking for, right? Serving as either their, their stewards and trusted with the people's decision-making uh, powers or are to be served as the mouthpieces. The founding fathers uh, argued back and forth as far as, as those two views of the congressmen. Section four, Congress must assemble once per year, so they got to do their job. They have to come and meet and address issues that their uh, uh, constituents who elected them uh, want to be, um, to be uh, um, engaged in in discourse, right? 
And how much more now when you have the initiative, uh, the state levels at least, uh, people can uh, sign, uh, you get so many signatures and you bring it to your state legislator and they have to address, uh, they have to address that, um, that issue that you brought forth with the initiative. And so that's going to be added to, um, you know, to uh, American political tradition during the progressive era in the early 1900s. Uh, section four, or I'm sorry, section five, they must keep a journal of their proceedings and from time to time publish it for the people. So anything that makes, uh, again, um, elected officials, especially uh, accountable, right? Uh, makes them in some way or another be transparent and show their constituents what they're voting for, what they're voting against, etc. right? Uh, to me, that would be enlightened. That's a way of holding them accountable. Section six and seven, right? Uh, you cannot have an additional office. And the idea here is, right, is you can't have a conflict of interest. Uh, you can't be a, a, a senator and um, and also on the president's cabinet, right? You can't be a senator and a house rep, um, especially when you go from one branch to another, like on the presidential cabinet, as well as being a senator, is you could do things that, that could benefit yourself um, and, and stand a reason to want to vote a certain way, to, to bring forth a certain issue, because in your other position, it would help you out. And that kind of goes in line with what I don't have on here, but you have later on in the Constitution, is there'll, there'll be no titles of nobility uh, here in the U.S. That's definitely enlightened, right? No special privileges for people on account of their last name and family connections, royal connections, as happened under Great Britain before we broke for independence, okay? And then also uh, the, the president has a, a check over the legislator that he could veto what they pass, what the majority in each house passes. But by a super majority or a two thirds majority, they could override that veto. So that's another kind of check and balance. So I put that in the line of Montesquieu and his spirit of the laws. I put that as enlightened, right, from his enlightened works. Then conservative, right? It, it differentiates when they're counting the house reps, free persons from Native Americans, not taxed. They're called Indians, not taxed. From those serving under uh, uh, labor, uh, temporary labor contracts or indentured servants. And three fifths of all other persons is a nice little euphemism for slaves, right? And so notice they don't even mention slavery outright. It's implicit, not explicit. But it's there. The Constitution implicitly okays slavery. Okay? And then the reps are not to exceed one rep in the House of Representatives for every 30,000 civilians. Uh, one voice for 30,000 people? To me, that's pretty conservative, right? That's not that democratic. And so I put this under conservative, and, and I, would, that, I would make the argument for that reason. By all means, you could, I, I love when someone puts a section of the Constitution in a category that I initially would not have put it in. And I love for that reason, that person to write at least one sentence def, uh, defending why that person believes it is conservative or enlightened or pragmatic, because I genuinely sometimes learn from you guys. And I, I'm, I'm uh, introduced to a perspective that I am not, had not previously been familiar with. Okay, and hadn't thought of. So by all means, don't think of it so much as a right and wrong answer. Uh, defend why you put it under the category that you did and have it make some sense uh, in light of my definitions, my subjective definitions of the three categories. All right. Um, senators were not directly elected. They were elected by state assemblymen right, who were elected. So they're one step removed from direct election. And by the way, when you look at the top, right, is there's no universal citizenship. That's definitely conservative. That's the way things have been in the past. Uh, the idea of having everyone uh, be a citizen uh, on account of their humanity, that's what the Enlightenment emphasized. That's what the Scottish Enlightenment, the Scottish Whigs or liberals, 
uh, what they pushed for. These were relatively novel new ideas and that was not implemented. Our founding fathers were not that brave, right? So, so much for citizenship for people of color, uh, for Native Americans, uh, at least Native Americans who would not drop their cultures and assimilate. And of course, so much for citizenship uh, for African Americans at the national level. That is not going to come until the 14th Amendment in 1868, at the end of this class, at the end of the Civil War. So it's a long time coming. Uh, I will say, however, there were three to five states that gave some citizenship rights to some African Americans. Usually it was the well-to-do who had some money and had been free and never been slaves. Uh, but like I said, we're talking three to five states max, and I believe a couple of them rescinded it. They went back on their word, just as happened for women. Um, in New York or New Jersey, shame on me for not remembering at the time. It's in my notes somewhere. Uh, but there was at least one state that initially gave citizenship to women, and they reneged on it. They, they changed their mind and took it back. So that's very conservative to me, allowing each state to decide what the requirements would be for citizenship. And then note, it stated right in section five that from time to time, Congress should should um, should publish uh, the notes of their proceedings, right? And who voted yay and nay on different things. It says, except in times in their judgment that requires secrecy. That almost takes away from that, that, that section of the constitution, right? Of making them accountable, making them be transparent to the people if they could decide, no, this is a very touchy issue, so we're not letting the public become privy to it. Uh, to me, that's very conservative, that's old school, the way things had been in the past. Um, many strong powers from the states were given to Congress in Article One, Section 8. But in particular, right, because you could make the argument, uh, I've seen it both, that Article 1, Section 8 is conservative and that it gives a lot of strong powers uh, to Congress and no longer to the states, as were uh, sometimes uh, uh, practiced during the Confederation. So in that sense, it's, it's conservative. It's, give, it's making a much stronger central government than under the Confederation. But at the same time, they are enumerated. They're specifically stated. And because they're specifically stated, it's implied that if it's not on that list, then Congress can't do it, right? So I've had some people put that down, Article 1, Section 8, as enlightened because it specifies and limits what Congress can do. However, they give themselves almost a get-out-of-jail-free clause at the end there. They say also, whatever is necessary and proper to carry out anything else on that list can be done also. And so that's going to enable Congress in the future uh, to, um, to broaden those powers, right? To add to that list by claiming that it's necessary and proper. And the most, um, the most salient, the one that stands out the most to me, example of stretching those powers is Hamilton's bank. Uh, you read Article 1, Section 8, you read Article 2 on the executive and the cabinet and presidency, you won't find anything that states that the federal government can uh, establish a partly private and primarily public or government uh, U.S. bank. It's not on the list. It's not in the Constitution. But what they claim, right, is they do have on the list uh, regulating interstate trade, right? Um, and um, well, that's the main one. Right. And also taxing and bringing in revenue, et cetera. And so uh, in doing that, they said it was necessary and proper to build a bank. And the Supreme Court uh, conservatively agreed with that argument and said the bank was OK because it was necessary and proper to establish that bank, even though it's not in the Constitution, in order to carry out its specifically or enumerated uh, power, stated power, of regulating interstate trade, okay? And then also in section nine, there's a 20 year gag rule. They cannot bring up the slave trade and make a, a, a decision on the slave trade uh, until the year 1808. And this was 1787, so technically 21 years. Uh, you could not even take the floor and, and try to uh, make 
uh, a suggestion for a major law in, in, in ending the slave trade. Okay, so to me that's conservative as well. Okay, so pragmatic. Um, I have here necessary tasks. Are there things that virtually every government must at least theoretically or hypothetically be prepared to do like contingencies, things that just pop up that they, they ought to be equipped to be able to do. So suppress an insurrection. Let's say there's a major rebellion, right? Or repel an invasion from another country. To me, I put these, and you could put these as conservative, right? Because that's a strong central government that's uh, denying the people's right to protest if it goes along the lines of destruction of property uh, and or, uh, you know, violence against uh, the authorities. And so this could also be put down as conservative. Um, repel invasions, like I said, it, to me, I thought subjectively that that's a pragmatic thing, that, that there ought to be something in there just in case of that contingency popping up. Uh, borrowing money, regulating interstate trade, uh, dealing with bankruptcies and patents, uh, post offices with a mail. Uh, to me, those are examples of, of, of it being pragmatic. They're not necessarily liberal nor conservative. They're just practical um, expediencies uh, that, that the government is equipped to handle and to deal with. Okay, Like I said, these are argumentative. And, and that's why I want to ask you, please, to use at least one sentence to defend why you put that particular section under that particular um, category. Okay. Then moving on, uh, let's see, to the executive, to Article 2, okay, the president, vice president, and cabinet, right? So uh, for one, right, uh, I put as enlightened in Section 1, um, there must be an oath to the Constitution. So to me, this is enlightened because what the Founding Fathers wrote, uh, some of the Founding Fathers like Dickinson and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin who were who's allegedly influenced by the Enlightenment, is they were afraid of arbitrary power. They didn't want a king or queen, right, an, an executive who could simply do however he or she pleased. Uh, it was the notion, right, that people can be um, inconsistent. They could become drunk with power and do one thing today and do something entirely different tomorrow and abuse that power. And remember, the Scottish Enlightenment was real big on that, afraid of the government's abuse of power. So to, to note, right, the president right away has to give an oath and say, I am the servant, right? I can't do however I please. I'm the servant to this written constitution. I can't violate it. I must defend it instead. So to me, that's enlightened for that reason, okay? Accountability of the president. Um, approves and executes laws, right? And so again, that's uh, a part of checks and balances. Congress makes the laws, but the president must approve them. And remember, they could override his veto, uh, his or her veto with a two-thirds vote in both houses. Uh, but at any rate, um, so that the president has a check and balance in approving legislation and then has a separate job of making sure that the laws that are made by Congress are carried out. That's literally the expression used in the Constitution. So hence the chief executive. Uh, they legislate, they make laws, he executes them, he carries them out uh, if the, if for, as far as their enforcement. So that to me that's a shared power, or not a shared power, it's a separate power. It's a, in the light of, of Montesquieu's idea of checks and balances, of different roles for different parts of government. Then sections two, three, and four. Uh, the president is a civilian leader over the armed forces. We were afraid, right? Uh, as you see, like with Julius Caesar in the past with Rome, etc., of military leaders using their power over the army, over the armed forces, uh, to defeat uh, uh, other political leaders, right? And so the idea of of um, having too much power in the armed forces was scary. That was definitely a threat uh, seen by the Scottish Enlightenment and the French Enlightenment. They didn't want that to happen. So to them, it's kind of a check and balance, if you will, having a civilian leader 
who, in, in of course, not in all cases, right? We have elected several um, former military leaders, but when they became president, you know, your Eisenhowers, etc., in the 50s, uh, who had led the forces uh, against Europe during World War II, he no longer could keep that same position. He was no longer in charge uh, of the armed forces as, a, as an army general. Now he's a mere civilian leader uh, as president over the armed forces. And note, right, Congress has the power to raise an army. Congress has the power to accommodate the state militias into a national army. Congress has the power to declare war. Then once they do, then this civilian president leads the armed forces in war. Okay, so again, they're sharing or they're balancing powers. Okay, so for that reason, I put this down as enlightened. Um, let's see here. Uh, appointments and treaties must be approved by the Senate, right? Uh, whether that be the Supreme Court justices or someone, uh, an ambassador to a country uh, or an official cabinet member. Uh, notice that it was this vague. So we didn't have um, the exact... Uh, cabinet positions yet. Those kind of organically, like a living organism, just kind of developed in time. So you have the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of the Interior, the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, okay, uh, etc. So, um, and then there must be a State of the Union address, uh, whereby, like you see the picture here with Kennedy, where the president is to not only apprise Congress as to what he or she is up to, uh, what he's planning, what his vision for the country is, but also even to give suggestions to Congress as to what he or she would like to be done in the form of laws. But notice, under the spirit of the Constitution, I subjectively, of course, am no expert on the Constitution and political science, but I think it's pretty clear that those are to be suggestions. They're not to be mandates uh, ordered uh, to Congress. And then you've had some presidents who took that stronger approach, uh, but they seem arguably to stand out as, as the anomaly, as, as uh, different from the norm, uh, like Teddy Roosevelt in your 102 class or your, your 17B class, uh, whereby uh, Teddy Roosevelt is, they're going to use the term bully pulpit, that almost like a preacher, he's up there preaching to Congress what they ne what needs to be done and telling them that if they don't do it, he's not going to ex ex exert his executive power and force them, right? That would be unconstitutional. They're independent as a separate body of people, and they alone are to pass the laws as the congressman. But he says what oftentimes will the president might do after Teddy Roosevelt is say, um, then I'm going over your head to the press and I'm going to the people. Uh, those who elect you into Congress uh, to put pressure on you to pass a law in this area or that area, okay? But still, in the spirit of the Constitution, there are to be mere suggestions. And so I put that as like a separate power and as a form of, of, of non-coercive collaboration, right? Where they can't force Congress uh, like old kings could in Queens. And then also, of course, the president is impeachable, could be removed from office, all right, so I put those as enlightened under Article 2 with the president and the cabinet. Conservative, right? The president, as we're seeing here during this election, uh, it's not by popular vote. It's through the electoral college system. Uh, electoral points, right, are in line with how many uh, senators and house reps uh, each state has. And uh, you win the state, you win the electoral points in that state. And initially, right, there were actual electors. So there's 55 in California, right? That there would actually be 55 electors. And if their party, it, it organically happened that way, that if their party wins the popular vote, that party's choice of 55 electors uh, votes uh, for that candidate. So it's still, it's a step away from popular count and, and majoritarian democracy. And so I thought that was conservative. Um, and that the president ought to be a natural born citizen. Uh, that had been the norm throughout different countries. Uh, with, of course, exceptions, however, when um, you had like the, the Hanoverian dynasty in England, 
they're originally from Germany. You always have exceptions to everything. But when you look at citizenship, when you look at those who ruled the different countries during the early modern era, most of the time they had to be uh, born and raised uh, in the country which they're representing, okay? Of course, with exceptions. So to me, there, there's almost a sense of, uh, of a xenophobia, right? Of a fear of outside foreign people and not wanting a foreigner to lead your country. But again, you could have put natural born citizen under pragmatic and saying, you know what, that's just a very practical uh, decision that, that, that just makes perfect sense. So by all means, you could put it under that category instead. Sections two and three uh, uh, that are conservative to me. The president has a lot of patronage power, that is appointing power, right? A lot of different offices, especially as new cabinets have been devised, as I, I named a few examples uh, just a few moments ago, uh, the president gets to choose those people. Member Senate has to approve. Um, but still, right, uh, that's old school. Uh, kings and queens had patronage power, right? Their chief executives of, of older kingdoms had power to appoint people to high offices. So I thought that was conservative in line with history. Uh, pardon power. Uh, the ability to, to uh, pardon people from prison and from major crimes, uh, that have, leaving that in the hands of one executive uh, to be able to pardon prisoners, etc. That's a very old school tradition. Uh, and so I put that under conservative, uh, but that's arguable. Okay. Um, can convene Congress. So sometimes uh, under special circumstances, the president can mandate and say, Congress, I want you to meet and I want you to deal with these issues right? If, if there's a, a quote, national emergency, etc. To me, that's conservative because that's what kings and queens had done in the past. They had power not only to convene parliaments and make them meet, but they could even dissolve them. Uh, and and um, so to me, that's old school. And so I put it under conservative. And then Article 1, right? Uh, going back to Article 1 with Congress, he has veto power uh, over Congress. And that's conservative, uh, where one man or woman could say, no, nope, you properly elected congressman made this law. I don't like it. I don't approve of it. And so, no. And of course, remember, however, they could override that veto. All right. And then also under Article 2, um, pragmatic, I put uh, treaty power. Someone's got to make treaties, right, with foreign countries. Patronage power, it's going to be pretty much inevitable that you're going to need ambassadors to be represent to represent our country in other countries and to entertain ambassadors from other countries, right? Uh, to me, that's just a practical thing uh, that there ought to be uh, provisions for. So that's arguable. That's subjective. That's according to me. I, I personally put those powers as pragmatic, as just making practical sense, not necessarily, you know, novel enlightened, liberal, uh, nor conservative, but just practical, okay? So, uh, and then miscellaneous. And also, I, I didn't do, because uh, I didn't want to make this video too long, but remember there's Article 3 on the Supreme Court. The fact that the Supreme Court justices are handpicked and they serve for life, for good behavior, is the euphemism used in the Constitution, right? Uh, I would definitely make the argument that that's conservative. They don't ever have to worry about what the people want. They could disregard it theoretically, right? Because they're not elected. They don't have to run for re-election. They don't have to be popular. And they get to make decisions according to their own discretion. Of course, right, uh, one of the, the main powers that the that Supreme Court has, uh, you're not going to find in the Constitution, ironically. And that's the power of judicial review, where they can make a decision on Congress or, or a presidential edict if they don't believe that it abides by the Constitution, they can nullify it. They can make that law no longer hold sway and validate it by saying it is unconstitutional. And like I said, look in Article 3 and you won't find it. Uh, you can make the argument, however, that it's pragmatic when you look at the, uh, their direct jurisdiction over certain things. An American citizen going to court against a citizen from a foreign country. An American citizen going to court against a foreign government, right? Uh, those are examples of direct jurisdiction going to the Supreme Court. You could arguably make the argument 
that um, that's a practical, pragmatic thing uh, that that those knowing that that inevitably is going to happen, and some some uh, court system, right? Some authority needs to make decisions of those sort in those fields. All right, so. I, I beg your pardon, but I didn't include Article 3. I didn't want to make this longer than it already is. So then miscellaneous, right? A added extra stuff from all over the Constitution. Enlightened, conservative, and pragmatic. So Article 6 says that the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. To me, that's definitely enlightened, right? That's saying that it doesn't matter what's popular for the uh, on behalf of the people and the and the legislators that are elected in the Congress to pass a law, that uh, we can't simply do whatever we want. Uh, the executive, uh, again, with an executive decree or action, etc., that everyone in all three branches, right, including the decisions made by the Supreme Court, that their authority is in the Constitution, and because. We believe that there are sufficient enlightened components to the Constitution, not to mention that a Constitution uh, is not arbitrary, right? It's written down, and so it, it doesn't change its mind. It doesn't, it's not erratic and changing back and forth the laws and rules. It's there once and for all for us to abide by. So the idea that this, this Constitution becomes the law of the land, to me, is enlightened uh, because, again, it's, it's saying that we're not to be ruled by people because people are fallible. People could become drunk with power. They could become would-be tyrants, uh, but the Constitution keeps them in check. Articles 3, 4, and 6, Supreme Court justices are appointed for good behavior. That's definitely conservative. We have a fugitive slave clause, right? That's definitely conservative to me, right? Um Although some people I've had put that under pragmatic and saying, well, the only way for the southern um, uh, the southern reps at the state constitutional conventions, right, that, that were to ratify or approve of the Constitution and nine of the 13 had to approve of it, that there's no way the southern reps would have um, okayed this Constitution uh, if we did not guarantee them the right to their slaves. So you can make the argument that it's conservative or make the argument that it's pragmatic, okay? Because uh, remember, pragmatic, you're amoral. You don't worry about doing what's right or wrong. You just yield a practical result and compromise. Um, all debts and property accounts uh, in one state are to be upheld in other states. So that means, right, if you're rich and you hold property in Virginia, uh, that is to be recognized in all the other states. If you owe money, in the state of Virginia, then that's to be recognized, that debt, in all the states. So to me, right, this helps cement the class differences that already existed between the rich and the poor. And so the, the a lot of the founding fathers at the Constitutional Convention, right, you can make the argument they were not a mini example. They were not a microcosm of the U.S. Uh, population. They were primarily wealthy. They were primarily college educated. Uh, most of them were lawyers. Uh, they were kind of, you know, saw themselves as the cream of the crop. So they put this in here, right, arguably, conservatively, for their own self-interest. They wanted to make sure that their money, their property, uh, their debts that were owed them uh, would be recognized all across the board, right, and, and to keep those, uh, those powers, if you will. Article 5, right, there's an amendment process. I would make the argument that that is pragmatic, um, that... Uh, the Founding Fathers made no pretense to, to, to uh, not being omniscient. They were not all-knowing, right? They had no way of knowing what issues future generations would face. And so for that reason, they said, we need to have a practical way of, of changing with the times, changing with the exigencies or the emergencies or necessities that future generations are going to be confronted with. So hence, there's a process by which new amendments can be added to the Constitution. I subjectively think that's pragmatic, that that makes practical sense. And then the Bill of Rights. And of course, I would say the Bill of Rights are enlightened, right? Because they codify rights that are to be natural rights, guaranteed to all the citizens. And so you look at the first one, right? The freedom of expression, the freedom of the press, right? Uh, provided that you don't destroy property 
and yet you don't uh, become violent. You have that right to peacefully protest the government and to express yourself. The Second Amendment, right, was all like the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, the, you don't want the government to have a monopoly on weaponry because it could theoretically turn that weaponry on its own people someday. So the people have the right to arm themselves and protect their families, etc. And then you look at um, our, uh, Amendments 4 through 6, and those deal with due process, what we're familiar with to this day, right? So that you have a right to um, uh, due process is the collective term uh, for all the natural rights that you are entitled to if you are accused of a crime. So you have a right right to commandeer witnesses in your favor. You have a right to counter the arguments of your hostile witnesses. You have a right to counsel with a lawyer to help uh, legally defend you. Uh, you have a right to have a jury uh, make decisions uh, on your fate and a jury that's impartial. Uh, that's interesting to me, right? Is that theoretically they are to be um, understanding of your plight. They're supposed to live in the same area in which you allegedly committed the crime so that they know what it's like to live there in that area. You can make the argument that they should be roughly of the same demographic you are. Uh, remember, demographic is a category of the population. Your ethnicity, your socioeconomic background, what you do for a living, etc., right? Uh, you can't be twice be put in jeopardy if you've been exonerated or declared innocent of a crime. They can't put you back again uh, and, 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 and hold you, uh, or I'm sorry, if you've already been held um, uh, guilty, uh, you cannot be, you, you can't be tried again. Um, you don't have to witness against yourself pleading the fifth, right? You don't have to be forced to, to tell on yourself, okay? And then you have the right to your life, liberty, or property. Uh, and then also with the Fourth Amendment is you have the right to uh, your property and possessions uh, from unreasonable searches and seizures uh, without a, a probable cause, right? Without grounds uh, for which believing that you are guilty and therefore like with a warrant, uh, the, the prosecuting powers having the right uh, to confiscate your stuff to look for indicting evidence against you only if they have probable cause. Okay, so to me, all of those are enlightened, uh, right? The Bill of Rights, the, the first 10 amendments that were quickly added to the Constitution. So I hope this, this, uh, this lecture helps, okay? So what you're doing is you're making three categories, enlightened, conservative, and pragmatic. And please put at least three or four examples under each of those three. And please give at least one example from the first three articles. Something about the Congress, right, in one of the three. You don't have to put in all of them, uh, but at least something under Congress in Article 1, under at least one of those categories. Something with the executive and president under one of those three categories. And something with the Supreme Court under one of those three uh, categories. And again, if you could put a sentence after you put each one, uh, just briefly uh, defending why uh, you believe that section is enlightened, or is conservative, or is pragmatic, I would greatly appreciate that, okay? So I hope this helps. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, remember, this is due uh, the night of 11-6, uh, right? This Friday night, uh, this is due at midnight. Please go by my announcement, okay? Because some of these assignments are doubled up and it's driving me insane because when I go on, on my, my end, I can't find them. And so they're giving falsely uh, premature due dates on some of these assignments. So go by my announcement in which I give exact dates for every assignment. It was about two announcements ago, okay? Find that announcement, write it down, take a picture of it, etc. Uh, because those are the exact dates that I want everything due uh, throughout the semester. I believe I did the whole semester in that announcement, okay? So I hope you're doing well. Again, Canvas message me should you have any questions, and good luck on this, okay? All right, you guys have a good day. Bye-bye.